All right, in this explainer, we are diving deep into one of the most incredible, most elegant processes in all of biology, eukaryotic DNA replication. Now, if you're prepping for a big exam like the CSIR net, you know that the little details really matter, and that's exactly what we're going to focus on today. So, think about this for a second. At the very heart of this whole process is a fundamental challenge, our genetic code. It's a massive three billion letter library stored on these long linear chromosomes. How does a cell copy that entire library with almost perfect accuracy? And this is the real kicker, how does it replicate the very ends of those chromosomes without losing critical information every single time it divides? That is the core puzzle we are going to solve together. So here's our game plan. We're gonna break this down into six key stages. First, we'll get a handle on the unique challenges that you carry out space. Then we'll get into initiation, this cool two-step process called licensing and firing. After that, we'll look at the machinery of elongation, the cleanup crew and maturation. And finally, we'll tackle that famous end replication problem and its absolutely brilliant solution to Lamarase. Okay, so first up, why is eukaryotic replication so much more complicated than say what happens in bacteria? Well, it really boils down to three main things. The sheer size of the genome, the fact that our DNA is linear, and that it's all tightly wound up and packaged into something called chromatin. I mean, just look at the differences here. They're pretty stark. Prokaryotes have it easy. A small, circular, naked piece of DNA with just one single starting point. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, we've got these vast, linear chromosomes that have to be carefully unwound from histone proteins before you can even begin. And to copy all that DNA in a reasonable amount of time, we need thousands of starting points, or origins. The whole process is incredibly tightly regulated. Okay, so let's dive into initiation. You see, to prevent total chaos, a cell has to be absolutely sure it copies its DNA exactly once per cycle. Not zero times, not twice, just once. And it achieves this through a brilliant two-step system. First, it licenses all the potential starting points, and only later does it give the signal to fire them. It all starts with something called the Origin Recognition Complex, or ORC for short. Think of ORC as the gatekeeper. It's a complex of proteins that sits on the DNA at very specific sequences, the origins, basically acting as a landing pad, marking the spots where replication is supposed to begin. The next major player to arrive is the MCM helicase. This is the engine that's actually gonna unwind the DNA double helix. But here's the crucial control point. It gets loaded onto the DNA in a totally inactive state. It's there, it's ready, but the power is switched off. This whole process is called licensing, and it happens only during the G1 phase of the cell cycle. The ORC complex calls in two helper proteins, CDC6 and CDT1. Their job is to literally pry open that MCM helicase ring and thread it onto the DNA. This whole setup, the ORC, the loaders, and the inactive helicase is called the pre-replicative complex, or pre-RC. The origin is now officially licensed, but it is still waiting for the green light. That fire signal, the green light, arrives at the beginning of S phase. This is when the levels of cell cycle-dependent kinases, or CDKs, start to rise. They act like a master switch. They go around phosphorylating parts of the pre-RC, which finally flips the switch on the MCM helicase, activating it to start unwinding the DNA and calling in the rest of the replication team. The origin has now fired. All right, the origins have fired, the replication forks are moving, now we're in the main event, elongation. This is where the real workhorse enzymes, the DNA polymerases, take center stage to build the new strands of DNA. What's really cool here is the clear division of labor among the polymerases. You have polymerase alpha, which acts as the primase. It's the one that lays down a short little RNA primer to get things started. From there, polymerase epsilon takes over the leading strand for smooth, continuous synthesis. And meanwhile, polymerase delta is the specialist for the logging strand. So why this separation of duties? It's all because of DNA's anti-parallel structure. Polymerases can only build in one direction, five prime to three prime. This means one strand, the leading strand, can be synthesized in one long, beautiful, continuous piece. But the other strand, the lagging strand, has to be made backwards in short little stitched together segments that we call Okazaki fragments. Now, just because the strands are copied doesn't mean the job is done. Nope, the cell has to go back and do some cleanup. Specifically, it needs to get rid of all those little RNA primers that polymerase alpha laid down and replace them with proper DNA. And here is a super important detail, especially for exams. There are two different ways the cell does this. 
On the leading strand, it's mostly an enzyme called RNHH that comes in and removes the RNA. But on the lagging strand, it's a whole different process. As polymerase delta is building one Okazaki fragment, it runs into the primer of the previous one and just pushes it aside, creating a little flap. Then, an enzyme called FEN1, or flap endonuclease 1, comes in and just snips that flap right off. In both cases, an enzyme called DNA ligase comes in at the end to seal the deal. So now we arrive at the central conflict, the major headache of replicating a linear chromosome. That very last primer on the lagging strand, the one that's sitting at the absolute tip of the chromosome, well, it creates a huge problem. See, when that final primer gets removed, it leaves a gap. But unlike all the other gaps we've seen, there's no DNA upstream of it. DNA polymerase needs a three-prime hydroxyl group, a little chemical hook to start building from. And right here, at the very end, there just isn't one. The machinery has nothing to grab onto to fill in that last little piece. And this leads to a pretty terrifying thought. If you can't fill that gap, then with every single round of cell division, your chromosomes would get shorter and shorter and shorter. You'd start losing essential genetic information. So the question is, does a piece of our chromosomes really get lost forever? Thankfully, no, because the cell has evolved an incredibly elegant, almost magical solution, a specialized enzyme called telomerase. Now, here's the absolutely brilliant part about telomerase. It's what we call a ribonucleoprotein. It's part protein, part RNA. And it's a reverse transcriptase, meaning it can make DNA from an RNA template. But get this, it carries its own little RNA template around with it and it doesn't fill the DAP on the new strand. Instead, it actually extends the end of the parent template strand, adding these repetitive DNA sequences to make it longer. Its mechanism is this beautiful three-step cycle. First, it binds to that three-prime overhang on the parental DNA. Second, using its built-in RNA template, it polymerizes a short DNA repeat, making that parental strand a little longer. And third, it translocates. It just slides down the new DNA it just made and does it all over again and again and again, adding hundreds of these protective little repeats. And that's how it solves the problem. By extending the parental template, telomerase creates brand new real estate. Now the regular machinery, the primase, can come in and lay down one last primer on this newly extended bit. This provides the three prime hydroxyl group that was missing all along, which allows DNA polymerase to finally fill in that original gap completely. The end of the chromosome, the telomere, is saved. But the cell adds one final layer of protection. That newly synthesized telomere still has a long three prime overhang. So a complex of proteins called shelterin comes in, binds to all those repeats, and helps this overhang loop back and tuck itself into the double stranded part of the chromosome. This forms a structure called a T-loop. It effectively puts a protective cap on the end of the DNA, hiding it from the cell's damage repair systems so they don't mistake it for a dangerous broken chromosome. And this brings us to a final, really fascinating question. You see, telomerase activity is really high in our stem cells, which is part of what keeps them going. It's also turned back on in most cancer cells, which is what gives them their immortality. But in most of our normal cells, it's shut off. And this is linked to the process of aging, so it makes you wonder, what would happen, for better or for worse, if we could find a way to flip that switch and turn telomerase back on in all of our cells?